joining me now from Leeds in the UK is Joe Walton. Her daughter Sarah was left disabled when a childhood measles infection returned later in life. Joe is now an outspoken advocate in favor of vaccines. In Milan, we have Roberto Burioni. He's a professor of microbiology and virology at Vita Salute San Raffaele University. And in London, we have uh, Helen Bedford, who is a professor at, of children's health at University College London. I thank you all for joining us on the Newsmakers. Joe, let me start with you. Um, measles is back. As somebody who has, whose family has been terribly affected by measles, how do you feel about that? And tell us, tell us what happened with your daughter, Sarah. Um well, I'll, I'll start with a little history of Sarah. Sarah um, kind of tumbled into the world at the beginning of uh, 1979 in a, in a big hurry in the middle of a snowstorm. And uh, she she bounded through her first year uh, eager to move and, and eager to talk and eager to do things for herself. Um, and then at the age of 11 months, uh, she contracted measles. She wasn't particularly poorly with the measles virus when she had it. She was covered in spots, uh, but she wasn't a grisly child um, and she remained very happy, very content and didn't lose very much sleep over it. Recovered very well. Uh, and we, she went on to have a very happy and normal childhood, um, went through school and uh, did very well. She was a bright, articulate, intelligent young woman who had a, a very great future ahead of her. Um, and at the age of 25, halfway through a midwifery diploma, she started feeling ill uh, and very rapidly deteriorated. And it, it took us from the back end of January, beginning of February, right the way through until September before we actually had the diagnosis, which is, um, as you know, a subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is caused by the measles virus hanging around in the, uh, the stuff system and eventually attacking the brain. So she has a degenerative mm -hmm. um, terminal neurological disorder now and and she has been the way she is now for 14 years so to hear that measles is back at the fall is really very upsetting and very disappointing i feel very sad that the amount of information around about how devastating measles can be is no more or no better now, no better right. taken on board by parents than we, you know, I didn't have access to the information mm -hmm. there is now. So it's disappointing yeah. people aren't taking notice. And, and Joe, you know, we, we can see Sarah over your shoulder there. If she had the ability to, to speak to us now, what would she say to those parents who refuse to vaccinate their children? Sarah, when she discovered what was wrong with her, was very sad that she was losing her future. But one of the things she kept saying to me was, Mom, this shouldn't happen to anybody else. It, I don't want anybody else to suffer. I'm going mm -hmm. to suffer. Uh, it's avoidable. People should vaccinate. People should be educated. And she used to say to people who got upset around about her, don't feel sorry for me. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. Educate yourselves. Right. Roberto Burioni, the CDC, saying the U.S. outbreak is the worst since 94. They have about a ni 940 confirmed cases. The World Health Organization saying 112,000 confirmed cases of measles worldwide. It's bad. Um, is it clear that this, is, this can be attributed to misinformation and the fact that a lot of people are just not vaccinating, Roberto? Well, uh, what's up, what happened in my country, in Italy, is really a clear demonstration of how bad can be the misinformation. We had the uh, measles coverage decreasing, uh, decreasing during the year, years, and uh, you know, in 2015, we ended up, uh, you know, at the level of, uh, let's say, a not not advanced country, and the consequence was a, a measles outbreak in 2017 with more than 5,000 cases and several deaths. 
This is really unacceptable because measles can be swept away. Just it takes to, to vaccinate, which is a safe, it's effective. And let's say in Mexico, since 1996, they have no measles anymore. They have no SSPE anymore. So it's avoidable. But there is the wrong information that vaccines are dangerous, which isn't true, that measles is just, you know, a, a nothing. It's very, very mild disease, which is not true. So uh, this is spreading mainly by social media, social media, but also by doctors, at least in my country. So the, we need an action, a concerted action, uh, you know, by journalists, by a medical association to keep our patients free from misinformation that can be literally deadly in some cases. Helen Bedford, to those parents who believe it in their hearts that they are right, and that they're right to be cautious about not vaccinating their children, how do you convince them? I think we need to um, think about the situation in the UK, which is a country where vaccine confidence is high. And by the age of five years, 95% of, of UK children have had their MMR vaccines. So most parents in this country do vaccinate their children. There is a very small proportion, probably about one or 2% of parents who have no vaccines at all. And they're determinedly opposed to vaccination. And this is the group who it is quite difficult to um, convince that they should immunise their children. But there are other parents who have concerns and questions. And for these parents, often all that is needed is to have a conversation with a health professional who can address their concerns and answer them and allay their fears. Yeah. Uh, Roberto, I dipped into some of their communities and some of their websites, and it's, it's absolutely clear that a lot of these people are just concerned parents, right? They're not saying, yes, we want to spread plague and spread disease around the world to destroy humanity. They're saying, well, we need to be careful. Some of them believe that the pharmaceutical, co pharmaceutical companies are making too much money and, and so on. But for example, they, they, give, they give examples of one five-year-old I was reading about, Holly Stavola, who got her second dose of MMR, MMR and then was paralyzed and died and so on. So they have a kind of kernel of, of truth and a, a germ of truth and then they use these examples to say, be careful, don't go along with it. How do you actually then, A, convince people, and B, if they are not convinced, what do you do about that? Well, actually, um, in, in my country, at least, uh, the real hard anti-vaccination people are not so many. We, a recent paper quantified them less than 1% of the population. I think these people are impossible to, to convince because they are not following logical, uh, you know, logical paths. And, you know, as a scientist, as a doctor, I only have logical arguments uh, to uh, put uh, in front of them, and they don't care about that. Uh, the problem is that they spread fear. I mean, it's very, it's very easy to scare parents. Mm -hmm. And so even if they are not so many, they are less than 1%. In the regions in Italy where they are very active, uh, uh, more than 20 percent of parents refuse, uh, for example, measles vaccination, and this poses a very, uh, you know, a very, very bad threat for the uh, for the health of the, of our community. I think that it's impossible to convince that you know, uh, let, let's say, hardcore uh, anti-vaxxers. But uh, we need to uh, convince all the parents that are undecided. And my right. experience is that we need to be on the social media for doing that, because right. social media are an important source of misinformation. Uh, Roberto, are you aware of what happened in the Philippines with the dengue fever vaccine and how that translated to people not trusting measles? Because this, uh, this is fascinating, because the, uh, the dengue fever vaccine had bad side effects, which then led to people losing trust in all other vaccines, which has caused a measles explosion with a severe outbreak of 33,000. So it wasn't even the measles vaccine in the first place that, 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 that made people hang a question mark over vaccines. How do you actually deal with that? That can only be dealt with, I guess, on a political level, right? Well, I think that, you know, all, all, uh, all medical, uh, you know, compounds can have uh, side effects. And uh, we had in the past uh, all kind of drugs having side effects. Vaccines are for sure, vaccines that are we using now uh, uh, are for sure the safest compounds that we have at hand. They are safe, incredibly safe. So safety, it's difficult to calculate 
the frequency of the, let's say, serious side effects. And they are extremely effective. So we will need to communicate this, and we need also to remind how bad diseases are, because vaccines are, in my opinion, victim of their own success. Mm -hmm. We don't see any more polio. And so people, they don't, they don't remember how bad polio is. They don't see any more diphtheria. But the reason we don't see diphtheria, we don't see polio, is because we vaccinate. Should we stop vaccination, we uh, would uh, see these uh, terrible diseases again in our country, and we don't want to see it. Right. Joe Walton, across the pond from you, many American states allow exemptions for religious or philosophical reasons, right? So in the name of freedom of religion and choice, many parents can opt out legally. California put an end to this, but many other states continue to have this. So parents say, well, it's our right and it's our freedom not to vaccinate our children, and they go along with us. What's your message to those parents, Joe? I think what I would like to say to those parents is that you don't leave it, love it, live in a bubble. Uh, sadly, the decisions that you take for you and your children impact on other people's children too. Uh, you know, Sarah caught measles from somewhere. Um, it may have been from the nursery that she was attending at the time because there were a couple of the cases. But it could equally well have been her just walk, uh, me walking her down the road in her stroller and she happened to pass by virus in the air from somebody else that had it and had walked past it half an hour or an hour earlier. Mm -hmm. it, it's so easy to spread this illness. We have the responsibility as members of society to ensure that we are all protected um, and not just to think about the little people within which we live. Mm -hmm. Helen Bedford, now the cat's out of the bag. They are, as we mentioned, more than 100,000 cases worldwide. What do we do? How do we find a way to re-eradicate measles? Well, we need different solutions in different parts of the world because the causes of these outbreaks vary from country to country. In some places, it's because of economic crisis or war. So there isn't just one reason that applies to all countries. But certainly what we need to be thinking about is improving access. So in the UK, most under vaccination is because parents have difficulty accessing services. It may sound strange for a country like the UK, but if you have a number of children or you're a lone parent, just the practicalities of getting your children immunized can sometimes be difficult. So it's making services more accessible. It's a range of factors. There's no one thing um, that, that is going to solve the problem. But certainly we need to be um, ad advising parents about how serious measles is. And since a lot of the anti-vaccine material seems to be uh, promulgated on social ma media, I think vaccine advocates need to be also mm -hmm. very prominent on social media. Roberta Burioni, where should people be getting their information from? Well, obviously, the first source uh, should be the doctor, the family doctor, the, the physician. But, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, we uh, see many people getting information from social media. Here in Italy, we had a situation uh, in which uh, uh, the only voices present in social media were the voices of the anti-vaxxers, the, vo the voices of the pseudoscience. Uh, now, uh, you know, we, uh, we as doctors, scientists, you know, the medical community, we started being and being active on social media. And actually, the situation improved. At least uh, a parent can hear also the voice of science, the voice of, uh, you know, uh, medicine. And so I think it's important, as my colleague just said, to be present on social media, to be prominent on social media, uh, because it's very easy to spread, uh, you know, the sense of danger. It's very, it's very easy to scare parents, and this can be, uh, this can have a very, very bad effect at the very end of the story on the health of a community. And Roberto, should anti-vaxxers be punished? I personally, this is a personal feeling. I'm for freedom of speech, and I don't think they should be punished. I think anyway that you know the uh, vaccination could be compulsory uh, the moment you decide to bring your child to school. Because uh, you, you, if you want the freedom to not, not vaccinate your child, you want the freedom to damage somebody else. We see uh, somebody that uh, contracted measles at 11 months. Well, the vaccination er can be uh, given around 13, 14 months. So the only way we have to protect uh, 
children that are 11 months old is to vaccinate other children because they can't be vaccinated as they are too young. Joe, should anti-vaxxers be punished? I think that punishment is the last thing. It's a carrot and stick approach. I think here we have to educate people. We have to give people access to the information about how devastating these illnesses can be. And then if people continue to refuse, then they should not have access to the same things mm -hmm. that parents who choose to vaccinate have got access to. So I kind of agree with our friends from Italy that perhaps school is a place you can't go unless you're vaccinated. Helen, punishment, but only as a last resort, maybe? Um, I, I, I don't think we should be going down the road of punishment because I think you might get a backlash if you did that and have more people coming out um, with those strong views. But in terms of whether a vaccination should be required for school entry, I like the, the causes of these outbreaks in different countries. The, the, it's very context specific. So in the UK, for example, we don't have any uh, requirements for immunization at all. It's a recommendation and we still have very high rates. And one of the problems about bringing in mandatory vaccination is you may have untoward consequences. So people who don't want to have their children immunized aren't going to get them immunized just because mm -hmm. they can't, can't go to school. They may set up their own unregulated informal childcare um, situations, which may be actually worse for a child. And what happens in those situations is it's often the most disadvantaged who become even more disadvantaged because the privilege will just find a way around it. They'll pay the fine or, mm -hmm. or set up their own school. So it's always the disadvantaged who suffer most. Helen Bedford, Roberto Burioni and Joe Walton, great to have you all on the Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>